Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Ali Aslan, international TV presenter, talk show host and journalist. And on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second edition of the Cus Turkey Digital Talks, a web series organized by the Turkey Bureau of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. This web series looks primarily at the political developments in Turkey, the Middle East, and the Eastern Mediterranean. And today we will focus on NATO's role and security in the region. Certainly no shortage of topics to be discussed in this particular context. I'm delighted to be joined by two wonderful speakers who bring to the table a great deal of knowledge and expertise. Uh, joining us this evening is uh, Turkish presidential spokesperson, deputy head of the Security and Foreign Policy Councils, as well as a special advisor to the Turkish president. Joining us from Ankara is Professor Dr. Ibrahim Kalin. Welcome, Mr. Kalin. Thank you. Also, also joining us is a longtime member of the German parliament. He's also the deputy chairman of the CDU-CSU parliamentary group in the German Bundestag, where he's responsible primarily for uh, the fields of foreign affairs and defense. Dr. Johann Waderfuhl is joining us from Berlin. Berlin. Welcome, Mr. Waderfuhl. Hello, good evening. We're going to hear from both of you in just a little while. But of course, uh, first up, uh, we are delighted to, to hear from our host this evening, namely the director of the Turkey Bureau of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, Walter Gloss. Walter Gloss, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, dear Ali. Uh, very warm welcome from uh, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Turkey and from my side. And a special thank you to you, Ambassador Professor Dr. Kallin, and you, Dr. Wadeful, for your participation. Also, thanks to you, Mr. Ali Aslan, for moderation this second digital talk organized by Konrad Adenauer Foundation Turkey. My pleasure, uh, Walter. And, and let, let's dive right into it. Obviously, the, the CUS, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, has done extensive work uh, on this issue on security in the region. Um, uh, tell us, t fill us in what you have been doing on this topic. Oh, uh, give me one or two minutes, uh, not more, please. Uh, so uh, everybody knows the issue of NATO and uh, security is a very important issue, not only for the relations between Germany and Turkey. However, it has become one of the core issue for CAS in recent years. So we dedicate ourselves to the topic in different formats. For several years, we have been organizing one of the largest security conference in the region, our Istanbul Security Conference. Over 230 experts and politicians participated last year. So hopefully, hopefully we can hold the security, security conference this year. We expect an equally large number of participants. This autumn, our security conference or security workshop takes place in Berlin, in which security experts from Germany and from Turkey will take part. Another is in November, we are organizing a cybersecurity workshop together with uh, Turkish organizations. And last but not least, we also support visitor programs and programs for politicians on the subject such as organizing a digital talk today or to a larger extent uh, inter-country party dialogue. What extensive, substantial and important work that the Konrad Adenauer Foundation office in Turkey is providing for German-Turkish relations. And Ibrahim Kalin, before we get into the nuts and bolts of NATO's role and security in the region, let's talk just very briefly about current German-Turkish relations, because I know there's a little bit of a hiccup there. Germany has declared Turkey a high-risk region when it comes to the coronavirus and has issued a travel warning. Of course, this comes right before the, the very important summer vacation season 
is about to open. I know the Turkish government is very displeased with this decision and is calling it uh, a, a false decision for that matter. What, what do you make? What do you make of the, the decision on the part of the German government to declare Turkey a high risk area when it comes to COVID-19? Well, we have managed the COVID-19 process quite well. Actually, Turkey and Germany are probably among the, the best two countries in the world that have handled this crisis better than any other. Uh, if you look at the numbers, number of cases, number of deaths. In addition to that, we have taken a number of measures most recently to welcome uh, foreign tourists to Turkey. We receive uh, three to four million tourists from Germany. I know the German tourists uh, themselves are very eager to come to Turkey. Our uh, the tourism minister uh, sent a letter to his counterpart uh, uh, in Germany explaining uh, the measures and uh, the precautions that we've taken uh, so far. I had a chance to discuss uh, all these issues last Friday in Berlin with my colleagues and we continue the conversation. Uh, of course, we are disappointed uh, uh, by that declaration, uh, but we have also agreed to continue this conversation. Uh, we were told that the German authorities will update uh, their data, uh, therefore their decisions, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, and we will share all the information that we have. And if you look at the number of cases in Turkey, it's very, very low. Uh, right now, just today, our uh, health minister announced uh, the current number of cases in the entire country, uh, which is around 1,200 or so. Uh, it used to be actually below 1,000 until a few days ago, but it's to be expected. You know, it will be up and down, but the numbers, the percentages are very, very small. More importantly, uh, the number of deaths uh, are, are going down, the number of infections are going down. And uh, in the southern areas, the touristic areas, uh, places like Antalya, Bodrum, and these places, in fact, have the least number of cases uh, and deaths uh, in, in Turkey. Therefore, uh, we are confident uh, that these uh, evaluations will be revised, will be updated as we share more information with them. In fact, our uh, tourism minister had uh, uh, a large number of ambassadors uh, in the city of Antalya today explaining to them uh, the measures that they've taken and uh, uh, we will welcome any official from Germany, from Berlin or from the German embassy or any other European country to come uh, and uh, look at these measures uh, themselves and see what kind of measures we have taken. So I'm, I'm confident that yeah, yeah, these decisions will be revised very soon. So you are hopeful, you are optimistic that the German decision uh, will be revised uh, at the end? Yes, I think it will be in the interest of not just uh, Turkey and Turkish uh, tourism industry, but also uh, we have a large number of German companies doing business in Turkey in the field of tourism, uh, German operators. Uh, in fact, uh, the Antalya airport is run by a uh, German company, German tourist operators and German tourists themselves. And I believe uh, it will be in the interest of both countries and both people uh, to revise yeah. these decisions. Of course, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we keep our people safe uh, and healthy uh, and also those who are coming to Turkey come uh, in a healthy and safe way. So we've taken measures such as, uh, you know, uh, measuring their uh, temperatures before they enter the country, taking tests uh, before they enter the country or taking tests here at the airport. And if there are any cases, any positive cases or, or any other symptoms, uh, they will be given immediate uh, health services here. We've increased the number uh, of health services uh, in the tourism areas and uh, most of the touristic areas, hotels, motels, restaurants, etc. In fact, will uh, work at a capacity uh, uh, announced by our health ministry. Uh, they will be less than normal capacity to make sure that social distancing and other things are kept under control. Johan Vadafoul, uh, we just heard from Ibrahim Kalin that the Turkish government is disappointed in, the German, in Germany's decision to declare Turkey a high-risk area when it comes to COVID-19. Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu went as far as to say that this is a political decision, not one based on actual data. And the case, of course, can be made that countries like Italy and, and Spain, for instance, which had a much higher uh, case and death toll, uh, are now free to be accessed by, by German tourists. Let me get your quick take on this. Thank you very much. Can I, can I first of all thank uh, the Adenauer Foundation for having us, uh, for organizing uh, this talk and and you and and uh, Ambassador uh, Kalin for having us uh, tonight and it's it's a great pleasure for me. But coming to that issue, of course, I am disappointed as well as Mr. Kalin is, and I I can uh, only uh, prove that that a lot of Germans are really eager to travel to Turkey. This is is, is uh, really a, a situation which is only related 
to the pandemic in which we leave, live and you know that the German government has always made in the last weeks I, I, on, or months a very restrictive uh, policy which was uh, really successful if you compare us with the countries Mr. Kallen, you just mentioned, if you look to Italy, if you look to Spain, there we saw a very high number uh, of infected persons. And this, what, this is what uh, Germany uh, luckily was uh, able to avoid. And we, of course, uh, uh, would like to be uh, as successful in the future as we were in the past. So we just uh, saw a increasing number in the last uh, 24 hours. So. Uh, this, there was no other uh, possibility for the German government as to take this advice. But if uh, we see a new development, everybody also in Germany would be very glad to take a new decision and to release uh, all uh, the, the advices which uh, were taken only in this uh, current situation. I'm very uh, optimistic for the future. I, uh, I'm sure that there is a very close contact between the two governments. And so let's let's wait. We have to see from from day to day, from week to week. And the earlier it is uh, possible to release these these uh, measures taken here, uh, then everybody would be happy here in Berlin as well as in Ankara. And as I understand, listening to both uh, you and Ibrahim Kallen, the discussions and the negotiations over these decisions are still ongoing. And the final word obviously has not, not been spoken on this particular front yet. Now, corona, the coronavirus obviously has dominated the global headlines for the past uh, three, four months. But uh, the world did not stop. Quite on the contrary, Ibrahim Kallen, many, many uh, topics are now uh, slowly emerging. Political security issues are now slowly emerging in the headlines uh, again. Let's start with the current situation in Libya, a situation, a country where Turkish forces are very much uh, involved, of course. We had the Berlin conference at the beginning of this year to solve uh, this issue. But at the end of the day, uh, this was at least uh, from, the get from the current onset Soft uh, militarily, of course, uh, Haftar was backed by Russia and NATO member France. The Libyan Prime Minister Faiz al Sarraj and Tripoli was backed by your government, Ibrahim Kallen. And it seems that he has prevailed, that, uh, that Prime Minister Faiz al Sarraj has come out victorious in this. What is the current status? What is the status quo in Libya? The Libyan crisis has been going on for almost uh, nine years, almost 10 years now, since 2011, since the fall of Gaddafi. Unfortunately, the Libyans were not able to establish uh, peace and order and stability as many people uh, had hoped and expected. Uh, our efforts are designed to help them uh, reach that goal. And we do this under the UN mandate uh, with the Berlin Conference principles. Uh, when uh, the chancellor invited our president together with other uh, eight or nine countries, in fact, we're all together, there are 10 countries as well as the EU, the African Union, the Arab League, uh, we participated in the Berlin Conference and uh, we still believe that the Berlin Conference provides an important platform to find a sustainable political solution uh, to the Libyan crisis. But unfortunately, the Haftar side has undermined, sabotaged and basically destroyed all efforts at either ceasefire or a sustainable political solution, not just since the, uh, the Berlin conference, but even before that, they had uh, a meeting, uh, uh, an agreement, uh, so-called Abu Dhabi agreement uh, last year in April, uh, only two weeks after uh, they declared this uh, agreement uh, signed by both Saraj and Haftar, Haftar launched another military attack on Trablus, on Tripoli. Uh, and ever since then, it's been, um, uh, you know, this military conflict and confrontation uh, aggressively pursued by the Haftar side. And they've been supported by uh, the Russians, it's no secret, uh, by France, uh, by Egypt, by UAE, uh, a number of other countries uh, bringing mercenaries uh, from different parts of the world, providing finances, but more importantly, and uh, more uh, uh, destructively, unfortunately, you know, uh, airplanes, jet fighters and military equipment uh, and all of that. Seeing this situation, the Saraj government, which is the, the government of national accord, recognized by the UN as the legitimate government of Libya, approached us last year uh, and uh, we signed uh, a military cooperation and training agreement. Uh, so it was upon the request uh, of the Libyan government to establish this uh, uh, military uh, uh, agreement 
uh, to which our president said yes. And uh, and our uh, participation or involvement or or intervention, whatever you would like to call it, uh, in uh, in that process has brought a degree of balance, uh, a fact that is acknowledged by everyone. Otherwise, uh, Haftar will have uh, destroyed uh, and continued this 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 fight, uh, this this uh, illicit, illicit and uh, costly war uh, against uh, the Libyan people. Uh, and now there is a degree of balance uh, there. We would like to see a. A political resolution of this conflict. We don't want the military conflict to continue, but uh, we have to also remember that it's the Haftar side that has been launching this military attack one after uh, another. The Sarraj government, the government of uh, National Accord, has been very constructive in its approach, has uh, participated in the Berlin conference, gone to Moscow before that, uh, agreed to UN principles to have the military council five. Uh, plus five from both sides uh, and uh, they have upheld the ceasefire and and everything but the Haftar side has uh, has betrayed and uh, undermined all this so now of course they don't trust Haftar anymore they approach uh, any kind of immature ceasefire as another tactical move uh, by Haftar and his backers uh, to gain time to buy time uh, in fact uh, as we see uh, it's it's no secret that uh, they are trying to increase their military presence uh, in Jufra, uh, in uh, uh, in Sirte, uh, and other parts of Libya. Uh, it it all looks like you know they are preparing for another uh, major military uh, attack. And against that, uh, the Sarraj government uh, has to take precautions, and they have right. to defend. They have a right to defend themselves, and we will continue to support them politically, security-wise, and in other areas to make sure that. Number one, uh, the, the UN principles and the Berlin Conference uh, principles are upheld. Uh, number two, Libya is not divided. Uh, it's not split uh, between East and West, between Tripoli and Benghazi. It will be a disaster uh, for a country like Libya try to uh, you know, split it up, uh, either uh, de jure or de facto. Uh, we have seen this in, in, in Iraq, uh, the, the terrible consequences of this kind of approach to uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, and other other places, uh, uh, we we support the political unity and territorial integrity uh, of Libya. And any political solution uh, has to ensure that this is the case that re Libya remain uh, united uh, territorially and politically. Let's bring Yuan Vadaful in here. Uh, Ibrahim Kalin, the Turkish government supports a political solution here. One, of course, that was set out by the Berlin Conference at the beginning of this year, Yuan Vadafol. As we said, the Haftar forces backed by Russia, France, the UA UAE, and Egypt seem to have been defeated, and the Sarraj uh, unity government in Tripoli, supported and backed by Turkey, uh, seem to have prevailed. What's your, what's your take on the current situation, and more importantly, how we go forward from here? I think your microphone is still off, Mr. Vardafur. Oh, sorry, my microphone. No worries, off. these these things can happen. Sorry. We're live, and this is when you would go back. ahead. I'm back. Happy to hear uh, that. I would first of all, I would I, I would like to agree that after a very long time, nearly a decade of of failed trials from the United Nations to bring the parties within Libya together, it wasn't. It was time for a new approach, and I'm still happy and proud that, that uh, our Chancellor, Ms. Merkel, uh, took the chance and went forward. And with the help of, of, of a lot of friends, one of the very ones with a very positive role in this process was the Turkish president, Mr. Erdogan, brought all the external supporters together in this Berlin conference. And I think this was a new approach, and we still think that this approach is the only one which could, in the very end of the day, be successful. But today, uh, to be honest, we are, of course, a little bit concerned about the development uh, after the conference itself. We see that a lot of commitments given from different sides taking part in this conference were not observed. So we still see arms shipment to Libya, which is absolutely 
the opposite of what was agreed here in Berlin. So what we now need in our eyes is we need uh, measures of building trust. And for this reason, the agreed surveillance uh, of all the borders uh, uh, of Libya is still necessary. And for that reason, the uh, EU has also brought out the mission of uh, Irini. So, but this is only one attempt to, to, to guarantee, uh, not fully, but to, to deliver a little bit to, to, uh, to the uh, necessarily, uh, uh, necessary surveillance uh, of this country. And all partners uh, in NATO uh, uh, are asked to, um, to, to, to support this, as we do. With now with, with, a, with a plane, later on with a ship, and others also. And we, we are very happy that, that uh, all partners in NATO uh, are ready to support uh, this mission. And what we, of course, see with, with great concern is if then NATO partners come into a conflictual situation on sea. So this has, of course, to be avoided. Because we, we have, as NATO, uh, normally, and also especially in this situation, we have a lot of enemies, we have, we have a lot of adversaries, and I fully agree with Mr. Kalin that, that what, what Russia is doing there with uh, the Wagner troops and so on is not uh, helpful for bringing this uh, Berlin process uh, to, uh, to um, success. So what we really ask now all external supporters to come back to the negotiation table and to fulfill all their commitments to stop the delivery of, of arms and weapons to that country and to help uh, uh, to calm down the conflictual uh, situation right. within Libya, stopping offensives and counter offensives and uh, bring the United Nations then in a situation that they are able to deliver peace, uh, fruitful peace it, talks. Ibrahim Cullen, just, just quick, quickly, since we have a lot to go through here still and uh, already time, uh, we're 25 minutes into this discussion. One country that is conspicuously absent from the Libyan discussion is the United States so far. Uh, would you welcome a US involvement at this particular point? Do you even see a role for NATO? Well, you sh certainly NATO should play a role there, but we should have uh, a unity of ideas and minds and hearts first within NATO. Uh, the, the American policy has been kind of uh, on and off uh, on the Libyan issue. I mean, they were active at one point, actively and openly supporting Haftar, and then they kind of disappeared. Uh, you know, they shifted their focus to some other things over the last few months. Obviously, they've been dealing with uh, uh, the pandemic, COVID-19. And uh, in my conversations with my colleagues on the U.S. part, uh, we've raised this uh, issue and our presidents have spoken about this uh, within NATO and, uh, you know, as a major player uh, on, uh, on the global scale. Uh, do you, you, the U.S. has a role to play, no doubt, uh, in Libya. But uh, we, again, we see this uh, 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 a role for all players within the UN mandate, the Berlin Conference principles, uh, in which all these countries uh, participated. Um, you know, we live in a world in which when there is a strategic vacuum, somebody fills in. Uh, as Aristotle once uh, said, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, uh, emptiness. Uh, and this is true in politics too. And there is, you know, vacuum. You know, someone else, some other actors and players will certainly fill it in. This is what's happened. This is what happened in Syria. This is what's happening in uh, in Libya. Of course, we do not want to see a repeat uh, of the mistakes uh, that were made uh, in Syria to be repeated in in Libya. The, the Libyan case is even more uh, sensitive uh, in many ways. So close to Europe. Uh, you know, it's the southern flank uh, or the southern part of, uh, of NATO. Uh, there is the issue of uh, irregular migration, illegal migration, human uh, smugglers and, and, and all of that. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the U.S. side uh, probably is considering to put more emphasis and focus more on this uh, on this issue. This is the sense that I get from our conversations, from my conversations with my uh, colleagues on the on the U.S. part. Uh, but uh, again, the framework should be defined uh, clearly. And uh, right, uh, be, uh, you know, if, if there are any attempts 
to support one side that will lead to the splitting up uh, of Libya or the continuation of this conflict in one way or another, and this is what we see some other countries are doing, uh, unfortunately, it will not lead to uh, an agreeable solution, a sustainable uh, uh, political resolution of this conflict. And you've already stated that, that it's not, no secret uh, that Russia and Turkey are on opposing sides in Libya. There's, they are also on opposing sides in Syria, of course, uh, a conflict that you've just uh, brought up as well. In March, you had a Turkish-Russian deal that uh, brought, uh, brokered a ceasefire in Idlib in northwestern uh, Syria. Um, it seems to me that Turkey is uh, getting settled in Idlib and has no intentions to leave anytime soon. What can you tell us about Turkish involvement uh, in northern Syria right now, Ibrahim Kalin? The ceasefire that our president reached with President Putin uh, on March uh, the 5th uh, is, is, uh, is holding. Uh, it's not an ideal situation. There are problems. There are still provocations and violations by the regime, sometimes by forces backed by Iran. And we raise this issue uh, immediately on a regular basis uh, with the Iranian and Russian colleagues. Uh, yes, we have our differences uh, over the Assad regime or the role, the future uh, of that regime that has killed its own people for the last uh, eight, nine years, almost 10 years in their thousands. Uh, we believe that the Assad regime has lost its legitimacy and credibility. Uh, Assad is not the political figure to unite Syria again. But the problem uh, is, is that you have major uh, stakeholders and players in Syria now, from the US to Russia, from Iran to a number of other countries. And nobody wants to see Syria as a whole. Everybody is interested in their little enclave of interests. Some in northern Syria working with PYD, YPG, some in other parts in the more Shia, you know, Nusairi part of Syria, which, you know, leads to all kinds of ethnic problems and tensions uh, and sectarian problems, etc. Uh, it looks like uh, the mistakes that have been made in Iraq um, are being repeated in some other context. Uh, in, in Syria. Uh, if uh, we put Syrian interests first rather than our own narrowly defined national interests or selfish interests, we can make a contribution uh, to this, to the resolution of this conflict. Remember, Turkey hosts, you know, f almost 4.5 million uh, refugees from Syria alone. And we have the uh, largest country in the world with the largest number, we are number one country with the largest number of refugees in the world. Uh, and we face uh, security challenges from the Syrian Assad regime, as well as from the PKK, its Syria branch, PYD, YPG. Uh, and we had uh, faced the threat of Daesh or ISIS against which we fought uh, uh, in a number of places in Syria. Uh, we will continue this mission, uh, helping the refugees, helping as many people, up to four or five million uh, Syrian IDPs on the Syrian side also. But you have to understand the, the, the majority of the burden is on Turkey's shoulders. And this is not only not fair, but it's not also feasible. Uh, if, if uh, you know, you want the, the, the migration problem to be solved, if you want a political resolution uh, to be uh, obtained uh, in Syria, uh, more serious, responsible political engagement is needed with a view to see Syria as a whole and put Syrian people's interests mm -hmm. before uh, anyone uh, else's interest. That, that has not been the case, unfortunately. So you have a failed state and ongoing civil war uh, in Syria. This is one of the challenges we face in this world. Um, uh, NATO as an alliance uh, is facing this challenge of the rise of non-state actors and failed or failing states uh, around the world, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq or in Somalia or in uh, other parts of the world. Now you see it uh, in, in Libya. This is not helping uh, uh, NATO as an alliance. This is not helping the global peace and order. It's, it's, it creates problems that, that go global immediately, creates problems for everyone. Right. Johan Vadafoul, Ibrahim Kalin said Turkey is housing, uh, hosting more Syrian refugees than any other country in the world. But of course, your country, Germany, itself also holds a very sizable segment of Syrian refugee, more than a million uh, in uh, Germany. Therefore, Germany is very much invested and is eyeing and observing this particular conflict up close and personal. You're a seasoned foreign policy expert. Uh, what do you make of the current uh, situation of the status quo in Syria? Yes, first of all, I, I would like to underscore what, what Mr. Kalin said, that 
we know that uh, Turkey hosts uh, this great number of, of refugees and does a very great, amazing humanitarian job with, with schooling them, them and giving them jobs and flats and so on. We know that and for that reason we are really grateful to have that treaty between the European Union and, and Turkey and we want to prolong it and if, if new negotiations are necessary we are, we are ready for them because it is in the core interest not only of uh, Germany but also the European Union and I think the Turkey and of, uh, mostly the, the people themselves that, that they are able to live there and that burden sharing under this aspect between Turkey and the European Union has to take place in a way that uh, this is possible for Turkey also for the future. And let me mention to that, uh, Mr. Kalin mentioned all the people living uh, as IDPs on the Syrian, uh, uh, in, in Syria itself. We uh, are doing everything to prolong the border, uh, border uh, cross-border agreement uh, uh, in the S S uh, Security Council in, in New York and with, with help from, from a lot of friends, but uh, unfortunately it is vetoed by, by Russia and we very much hope to overcome this situation. So this could be helpful uh, in that uh, current very critical situation. But in the end of the day, we need a pol political process. We want to keep Syria together, not to divide it, it, to divide it. It's not in the interests of Europe, I think also not of Turkey, of, of anybody living in Syria, that this country should be divided. And for that reason, we, we have to see who is able and who is willing to bring that political process forward. Uh, and we see here, as well as in Libya, that the United States is unfortunately, in our view, diminishing, uh, reducing uh, uh, its, its not only military but also political uh, uh, measures in that region, not only in Libya, but also in, in Syria. So it, it, Europe has to do more and Germany is willing to do more. And for that, we, we need uh, a cooperation between Turkey and the European Union. And I think that is, that is not only if it comes to Libya, but also to Syria. This is the southeast flank of the NATO. Uh, it's in our neighborhood. And we are really keen to, to come together and to work uh, together with Turkey on, on, on these two dossiers. Ibrahim Cullen, uh, both of you have mentioned uh, the vital role that refugees play in this pol political uh, discourse. And of course, uh, the refugees from Syria are also somewhat of a source of friction with your neighboring country and NATO partner, Greece. As of late, both countries are sort of shifting blame as to uh, who's in charge and responsible for the plight of these uh, refugees. What do you make of the current tensions uh, with uh, another NATO country, NATO partner, Greece? Uh, well, the refugee crisis is not only Turkey's problem. I think it's everybody's problem. Uh, it's uh, therefore uh, not only uh, a national or regional issue, it has become a global issue. Chancellor Merkel almost single-handedly uh, brokered the March 18, 2015 Turkey-EU migration deal, and she deserves a lot of credit for it. And uh, she uh, received a lot of criticism, I know, from within Germany or also from Europe, but she did the right thing. Uh, you, you cannot address this issue uh, in a piece, piecemeal manner. Uh, you have to have a certain perspective, uh, a long-term uh, plan, to address th this was uh, the goal uh, of the March 18, 2015 migration deal. Uh, but look what happened over the last five years. It's been five years since we signed this agreement. Uh, look at the promises that were made by the EU. I'm not just talking about the, the money that was supposed to be given for the refugees, three plus three billion euros, uh, which uh, is still a very small number compared to the size and the enormity uh, of this problem and how long it is taking uh, to kind of unfold uh, as we go through this at this process, but also uh, in other areas also, vol voluntary acceptance of refugees for one for one, um, opening up new chapters for Turkey, uh, resolving the Schengen issue, updating the customs union. They were all part of this agreement. 
Um, I know there are uh, uh, countries like Germany uh, and others uh, that supported this process and support, uh, uh, would like to see more uh, progress made on all of these issues. But the net result is uh, that we have achieved only a very small portion uh, of that agreement, uh, while Turkey has uh, fulfilled uh, most of its commitments in terms of uh, taking care of the refugees, keeping them here in Turkey, etc. But as the conflict uh, prolongs, uh, it, you know, it becomes an overwhelming challenge and burden for Turkey also. Uh, you know, we are faced, Turkey is the only NATO country uh, that is faced with so many security and terrorism challenges. As uh, uh, NATO Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg uh, said recently, uh, and I, I quote, he said, Turkey is the ally most affected by the turmoil and violence in Syria. No other ally has suffered more from terrorist attacks and no other ally hosts more refugees. Now, this is a welcome acknowledgement, but how do you uh, respond to that in action, not just in words, but in action, in terms of helping Turkey help Europe, helping Turkey help resolve the refugee crisis, the security challenges, uh, political issues, and many other issues. So I think and one important lesson uh, for NATO uh, is that uh, NATO is a military alliance, but I think its political outlook needs to be larger and stronger than its military mandate uh, as an alliance based on protecting the borders of the countries, member countries, uh, you know, uh, established uh, in the last century against the Soviet communist threat. Uh, and NATO has gone through many stages since then. Now uh, we need uh, more political engagement and leadership uh, from NATO, a larger and deeper political outlook uh, than its uh, military mandate. Uh, when our yep. president, for example, raises the issue of NATO playing a larger role, he is not immediately calling for military intervention here and there. Uh, we are talking about uh, a unity of perspectives uh, within NATO, uh, having certain standards and measures to be uh, uh, abided by all uh, member countries so that uh, NATO can deliver. And you've spoken extensively about NATO's uh, role in the region and Turkey's role in NATO. However, um, even though you are on opposing sides in both Syria and uh, Libya, the Russia-Turkey deal on the S-400 missile defense system has, uh, has been criticized by the U.S. and NATO <laughs> members, has irritated a lot of uh, NATO members uh, as well. Uh, after all, you are two countries that support opposing sides in long-standing conflicts, as we have established in this conversation. Can you just briefly touch upon that, that, that move, the purchase of the S-400 missile defense uh, from Russia, Ibrahim Kalin, the rationale behind it. Turkey has been a member of NATO since 1952 and has been a very strong ally, uh, has participated in all of the major NATO uh, missions around the world and continues to contribute to NATO mission. And uh, we are committed uh, to the main principles of NATO uh, and uh, we will remain a strong ally uh, within NATO. But if you look at how Turkey's defense, security, threats and challenges have been approached uh, or helped uh, by not NATO as an alliance, but certain NATO members, uh, there is a, a lot of frustration uh, on the part of Turkey. Uh, our president spent an enormous amount of time trying to purchase the Patriot missile defense system. It began uh, during Obama presidency, even before but seriously, in earnest, it began uh, in the first part of Obama presidency. I mean, I know I was you know, present in all of these negotiations. Uh, he spent so much time uh, trying to purchase this defense system because Turkey is you know, such a big country as Turkey uh, with the lar second largest uh, army uh, in NATO uh, obviously needs uh, a strong air defense system. Uh, that whole process failed for one political reason or another. They said Congress and this and that. Uh, and uh, right in the thick of the Syrian war, the Americans pulled out the Patriot missile batteries that they had stationed uh, in Turkey. And a few months later, Germany pulled out its Patriot missile. The only Patriot missile uh, defense system we have now in Turkey is, is the one from Spain. Uh, and uh, now, we also tried to uh, uh, procure uh, the 
SEMTI defense system uh, from Europe. It's the French-Italian consortium produced by SEMTI. Uh, and uh, uh, we signed a, an MOU. Uh, I think it was about three or four years ago. Uh, but we made, unfortunately, again, very little progress. Again, for one political or bureaucratic reason or another. And uh, this all let Turkey and our president to look for alternatives. And he's been very transparent from the very beginning. He said, look, if you don't sell us this defense system with our own money, we are going to look for alternatives. They thought he was bluffing. No, he didn't bluff. He said this inside the room. He said this outside the room. Uh, and uh, and we went for uh, S-400. S-400, by the way- Has the purchase been fine. completed? Has the purchase been completed? Yes, yes, it was completed. The first battery actually is in Turkey. Uh, they're still in the process. Uh, and uh, our signing of the agreement for S-400 came before the Katsa sanctions bill at the U.S. Congress. Uh, and now the U.S. Congress uh, is moving backward and saying that they're going to apply this uh, to an agreement that was signed before they passed the legislation. And they want to penalize Turkey for this. Our president said again that we are interested in purchasing the Patriot def defense system. Uh, now they made it conditional. And it's just really not uh, the right way uh, yeah. of, of conducting diplomacy or doing business. You cannot so treat a country like Turkey like that and then put all the blame uh, on Turkey when Turkey has to provide its own uh, defense, has to take care of its own when it is attacked by PKK, by Daesh, by uh, the Syrian regime, by uh, the FETA terrorists, by this and that group. And we receive very little help, unfortunately, right. uh, from the NATO alliance or other NATO members. And when we look for so, alternatives, we are blamed for it. So Turkey feels abandoned in this particular regard on this issue by NATO members. Johan Vadafud, of course, we are talking NATO and security in the region, but we cannot talk NATO without the United States, of course, uh, if you will, the most prominent uh, a member of, of this alliance. And uh, we've already discussed lengthly the conflicts in Libya and Syria, two major hotspots, long-standing conflicts where the United States is conspicuously absent. Now, obviously, in Germany, much has been, much talk has circled around Donald Trump's, President Trump's move and decision to withdraw 9,500 U.S. troops from Germany. Um, which led a lot of people to question transatlantic alliance and uh, the U.S. as a reliable partner to begin with. What do you make of this? If you look at the broader context, and as we've seen throughout this conversation, there's certainly no shortage of conflicts all around the world, but in this particular region, in Turkey, the Middle East, and Eastern Mediterranean in particular, with the no U.S. involvement in sight. Is the United States still a reliable ally and partner in NATO? Yes, of course, the U.S. is and uh, was ever. Uh, though though we, we, we have some uh, discussions, especially about uh, the the probable withdrawal from, from 10,000 soldiers here from, from Germany to where, wherever, wherever. I don't really know where they go, perhaps to Poland, perhaps back to the United States. But uh, in the end of the day, we, we are working since decades together. And the only reason that, that we are living here in, in freedom and liberty in, in Germany is that we are under the conventional and, and nuclear weapon uh, uh, umbrella from the United States. And there's no reasonable uh, alternative to, the, to working very closely together with the United States under the framework of NATO. And also but, this this is a United States, a but this is a United States mm -hmm. that is very much in retreats. Uh, not to, to be fair, and it, it, this, has not, this retreat has not begun uh, under President Trump, but started even before him. No, they, what, what I, uh, I think if, if you look for a, a little bit, a little longer term, then uh, I think the tasks for the NATO have not vanished. They are still there. And I, I think, unfortunately, Russia, for example, is still an adversary for NATO. We have not only seen these, this in, in Ukraine, but also in other places. And perhaps uh, if, if Turkey looks, looks back to, to the cooperation uh, or the form of cooperation it has now with Russia, 
I don't think it's 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 very reliable for 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 Turkey what uh, uh, Russia normally had has committed there. If you look to the truce deal they they made, uh, we saw Russia after that uh, again bombing civilists in Idlib and so on and so on. So. Uh, and we, we spoke already about Libya. So in the end of the day, these tasks are still there and we have new ones. We have China, uh, um, General Secretary Stoltenberg mentioned China with uh, new challenges uh, uh, in the cyber sphere. And if you see this from the Washington perspective or from San Francisco, it is absolutely clear and reasonable and I fully understand uh, that the United States more concentrates on the Pacific Ocean, on, on, uh, on Asia, on North Korea and all the things uh, who are endangering the security of the United States from the East, from the West, this is their West. So uh, what, what, is, what, is, what has our reaction to be? First of all, uh, keep the United States within the NATO and keep the NATO together, not fighting against each other. Uh, and of course, this is only uh, what, what I can plead for and what Germany pleads for, also, especially if, if it comes to the situation uh, in the neighborhood of, of, uh, uh, of Turkey. Of course, if it comes to another NATO partner, which is Greece, uh, we want to work these two nations closely together uh, and because we need both of them. Everybody needs the other one and we need both of them and they need, of course, uh, our support. Only uh, if we concentrate uh, uh, on, on, on working together and, and seeing who is really an adversary for NATO, for our, for our freedom, for, for our living standard and so on, then we will be successful in the future. And if we do so, I think uh, Europe and, uh, and Turkey can reach a lot in the future. Ibrahim Khalil, I want to get your take on uh, US involvement or lack thereof in the region from you as well. You're a seasoned scholar and foreign policy expert for many years. This is quite unprecedented, right? I mean, world events, uh, current events taking place, uh, uh, on such a high scale and the US more or less nowhere to be found. What, what do you make uh, of this, uh, of, of the absence of uh, US presence uh, in these conflicts and what would your message be to the uh, Trump administration? I think we are all challenged by the failing global order. Uh, in one way or another, globalization is moving uh, in multiple directions in ways that are unexpected. I mean, look at COVID-19, what it has done to the world order. Uh, the most powerful nations in the world uh, have failed uh, at confronting, uh, you know, this this pandemic uh, created national crises, but also tested alliances, international institutions, including NATO and the UN, the largest institutions and military alliances uh, in the world. And everybody has its share um, of the malfunction of the global uh, order. You have the rise of uh, the non-state actors, failed or failing states, um, uh, global uh, regional challenges becoming global uh, 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 threats uh, for security. Um, I, I think, as far as NATO uh, uh, is concerned, uh, there needs to be a more coordinated effort uh, at the leadership level, at various other levels, uh, to streamline ideas, perspectives, uh, uh, identify threats. Uh, uh, and also focus on opportunities, you know, what we can do, what we can build uh, together. This is a world in which there is not a single center anymore. It's a world with multiple centers. I don't think any country, including the U.S., can claim to be the center of the world. And that's a thing of the past, actually. From a political point of view, uh, from an economic point of view, you have the rise of major you know, economic players and actors like China, India, uh, and others. It is supposed to bring a degree of... Uh, a balance or uh, uh, kind of an equality on a global scale, but it's not happening in that way, I know. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've said this all along that this so-called uh, uh, global liberal order has been neither global nor liberal nor an order. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it, it has functioned in, in many different ways, uh, has not uh, 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 sustained or created or sustained uh, 
uh, global justice and peace and, and stability. Uh, uh, that's why our president, you know, uh, he's been championing this idea of uh, the world is bigger than five, uh, because that is certainly uh, a fact. If you if you look at uh, all the major challenges and, and uh, crises around the world, and NATO needs to, uh, I think, learn important lessons uh, from from all this. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, prove to the world and to the members the relevance of the alliance at a time when everybody is coming up with an ill-defined, narrow uh, notion of national interest. You know, if you define your national interest in a very narrow way, it becomes self-defeating. It doesn't serve the purpose. Uh, we live in a world in which the only way to be strong and relevant is to help the poor and the needy. Uh, and uh, if you're talking about security, this is in this intertwined world where everything is linked to one another, uh, none of us is safe until all of us are safe. And if you define safety, security, your national interest in a very narrow, exclusive way, as some countries around the world are doing, uh, it, it, it defeats the purpose. Uh, and uh, you become vulnerable like everyone else. And NATO loses its relevance, its power, um, and we've seen this, unfortunately, Turkey has been at the center of this. You know, when we raise these issues, uh, we, we raise them uh, in the interest of our own security concerns, but also uh, in the interest of NATO, because we want right. NATO to be a strong and relevant uh, uh, alliance facing global challenges in effective ways. NATO must remain reliable and essential, says Ibrahim Kalin. I'm looking at the watch and... Looking, we're uh, slowly running out of time. I have approximately six, seven more minutes. That's why, in closing, I would ask uh, you, Johan Vadafool, Ibrahim Cullen has said that COVID-19 has changed and affected the security environment, not just in the region that we have focused on today, but worldwide. Um, give us a two, two minutes. I know it's not a lot, but to, to wrap up, how do you foresee the scenario? We are in the midst of a corona crisis, in the midst of a pandemic. How do you think we move forward here, security-wise? I think all the th threats we are facing have been speed up by uh, the coronavirus. It was a catalyst for everything. And that makes it a little bit more difficult to counter all these threats. And uh, I fully agree with Mr. Carlin to, to keep our liberal order uh, uh, safe. So what do we have to do is also to speed up in our ability to work together, to define our common interests and to concentrate on, on, on the basis, uh, the basis of uh, NATO, which is not only, I fully agree, only a military alliance, but also a political based on common values. So let's come back to that roots. Let's put them in forward and uh, live in the way uh, the values uh, show us. And if we see that, then, then we can be able uh, to be relevant in the future because uh, uh, it is correct. Nowadays, no country is the center of the world, but we have to see that China wants to become uh, until 2049 uh, the center of the world or something like that or to build up a sinocentric world which is very much concentrated on the will of what is uh, has been decided in beijing so if we in the west and for me turkey belongs to the west still uh, with all the difficulties we are facing and with, with all the differences which are part of it which belong to be uh, a part of, of, of the West. Uh, with, with, with seeing that and working closer together, we could initiate uh, uh, a new era of uh, cooperation, of working together between Europe uh, and Turkey. And if Turkey is willing to do that, we are also ready. Of course, there are differences. Not all uh, Turkey did in, in the last years was, was fully in our interests and, and was, was the same that we would have done in that situation. But if we are able to discuss these differences, of course, to hear, hear the arguments and then come uh, to common decisions, then a lot of uh, is possible. And I think we have to do so 
because the threats are great and Corona is still there. We are still living in that pandemic. Absolutely. The challenges are not going to get any smaller from here on. I think that has become abundantly clear listening to the, to the two gentlemen here throughout the past uh, 60 minutes. German-Turkish cooperation must be stronger, should be stronger, says Johan Wadefull. Walter Gloss, you, you had a chance, an opportunity to listen to Ibrahim Kalan and Johan Wadefull look at many hotspots in the region in terms of security, Libya, Syria, of course, the Russian-Turkish angle, the Russian-Greece relationships, uh, the role of the United States, quite a lot to digest here, I'm sure. What are you going to make uh, with all this input? So sorry, the microphone. So uh, in my point of view, this discussion shows us very clear that uh, we have to go forward with this issue. So we will continue to use our network to German and Turkish politicians to maintain the dialogue between the two countries. Then uh, the last months during the coronavirus uh, have shown us that other formats like digital talks webinars, online seminars are possible, but uh, sorry, uh, in my point of view, face-to-face uh, -face events are necessary and we need face-to-face -face events in the near future. And um, so, and uh, Professor Kalin and uh, Dr. Wadeful knows very well that uh, over the next few weeks and months uh, today, topic will be on the agenda, but also the topics of uh, the EU integration process, the modernization of custom union and visa liberalization, and not to forget the topic of migration. So we are in the last minutes, let me say a, a special thank you. I'm uh, very pleased uh, that uh, Professor Kalin and Dr. Wadefuhl accept our invitation for this discussion today. Thank you so much that you uh, participate us and uh, hopefully we can go forward together and uh, organize uh, the next political. And as Walter Gloss said correctly, there's no substitute for face-to-face -face, uh, discussions like these. Well, hopefully we can have those in person before too long as well. This wraps up the second edition of the Turkey Digital Talks organized by the Turkey Office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, a web series focusing on political developments in Turkey, the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean. I think one thing has become abundantly clear throughout uh, this uh, debate. Uh, well, there's no shortage of topics, no shortage of conflicts, and these will be with us for some time to come. This will remain a very hot region, a very peculiar and delicate uh, region for a long time to come. Thank you so much to our speakers, Ibrahim Cullen and Yuan Vadafu, for putting all this in perspective. And uh, thank you, of course, out there for joining us. We will, of course, continue to uh, monitor the situation and look at how German-Turkish relations will develop with a particular side on how the German government will uh, react and act on the travel ban that is currently in place. Thank you so much to Ankara, to Ibrahim Kallen. Thank you so much to Johan Wadefu, to Berlin. Have a great night and hope to see you all Thank you. in person Good soon. Good evening, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Bye-bye.